Welcome to the Sargasson Champions course. You are currently tuning into one of the videos produced for this course. Founding for the course comes from the Resilience, Sustainable Energy and Marine Biodiversity program, Prasembit, financed under the 11th European Development Fund, EDF, Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories Regional Program. Resembit is being implemented by Expertise France with the primary stakeholders being the 12 Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories. Let's get ready to learn together. So, as you know, my name is Francisca Elmer, and today I'm going to talk to you a bit about the sargassum influx and if it is a catastrophe or an opportunity. And first of all, I want to show you this little graphic, which looks really menacing, as if there's like some kind of outbreak or temperature increase. But this is actually what is called the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt that is growing every year. Well, it's kind of stationary, but every year in, in summer, it becomes much bigger. I'm going to rerun it again. And it goes from all the way from Africa to the um, Gulf of Mexico. And as you can see, in July is normally the maximum. And in July in 2018, was one of the biggest years recorded so far. Um, back then it was to about 20 million tons of sargassum that they spotted with satellites. Um, since then, last year was a little bit higher in sargassum, but all other years have not been as high as 2018. But the last few years were very close, so we definitely have a bit of a trend of it increasing or staying at that level while um, at the beginning when it started around 2011 to um, it would have we would have some years like 2013 when there was very little sargassum so it's still a bit erratic we can't say it's increasing all the time but um there is definitely a lot more now than when it started to, to happen. So a few years ago, I went to this workshop, um, um, a stakeholder workshop from the University of Southampton on sargassum. And it was really, really interesting because they were talking um, about the four sp perspectives of sargassum. So what people see and how people see sargassum. And I want you guys to, to put your hand up either um, virtually or, or actually on camera if you think sargassum is a merchant threat or a problem. Let me just see. So don't be shy, put your hands up. Ah, oh, I see quite a lot of hands. Um, what about who thinks that sargassum is the rainforest of the sea? or a place with, which is really important for biodiversity. Bless you. I can't raise my hand in this iPad, okay. Fran. <laughs> so a few ones, including <laughs> Arenthea. Um, what about sargassum as a lucrative resource? Yes, we got a few here as well. I think I see it as all of the above. Yes, me too. I don't think it's any one thing. I think with everything, there's pros and cons. Yes, exactly. And the last one is sargassum as a climate change mitigation method through carbon sequestration. Yes, a lot of hands as well. So depending on where you are and how you've experienced sargassum, you may see it as multiple things. Or you may see it mainly as one of these things. When I started um, experiencing sargassum in the Turks and Caicos Islands in 2018, I definitely first saw it as a merchant threat. I started reading literature about it and I learned about all the animals living in it and saw the rainforest of the sea part that is mostly when it's out in the ocean. And it wasn't until we had another researcher come to the Turks and Caicos Islands who was telling me about making biofuels out of it 
that I saw that it could be used as a resource and then maybe also for climate change mitigation. So definitely the more you learn about sargassum, I think the, the more you will have all four perspectives in your head and not just see it one way or another. So next, I'm hey, show you brother. what our um, podcast guests talk um, think about sargassum. So together with Evelyn and um, other people who are working in the sargassum world, we are doing a podcast where we interview people about sargassum. And the first 20 people we interviewed, we made this little short video about how they see sargassum. It's mainly in English, but some people we interviewed um, speaks more better Spanish and French, so it's a bit multilingual. Yeah, I think to me, something to look at. Something that I can see from space. It's an amazingly diverse and really important and unique habitat. Providing a hunting ground for those big fish. My goal is to find an oceanic white tip shark, a hammerhead shark, something like that. The baby sea turtle go to the Sargasso Sea. Cette mysterieuse mer de Sargasse que je n'ai jamais vue. Once it gets to the shore and gets to the beach, uh, it becomes a huge problem. Because they fill up bays where there is no oxygen in the water anymore and everything there is just dying. Et ces sargasses peuvent donc se retrouver contaminés en chlordécone. H2S, l'ammoniac et l'arsenic inorganique. Et ces produits sont toxiques pour ceux qui sont dans les zones impact for resort properties obviously besides the image impact the guest experience impact the smell um there's the cost and it's a sign of disrupted ocean ecosystem like us i've been proliferating because of you now do something about it so we do have the citizen science project ready anyone could use it satellites um to to detect the presence and the, the position on sargassum on a daily basis in cuatro etapas la contención recolección, disposición y la industrialización. Todos nuestros productos son hechos 100% de sargazo. Le côté inifuge o el côté resistance a l'eau naturel, je parle naturel. We can extract and we can refine seaweed by minimizing, if not outright avoiding in some cases, turning that biomass back into CO2. Whether we can turn this golden tide into a golden opportunity. You know, cultivating these seaweeds as gardens, as new kinds of gardens in the ocean is going to provide a whole new era in human civilization. So some of you may recognize Javier from um, Carissa and um, the bay behind him. And some of the people you've seen, you will also um, see again in the videos we made because some of them are our experts we asked. So let me give me a, give you a bit of an overview of what sargassum actually is. There are over 350 species of sargassum algae um, known, and most of them are like regular algae. So they have a hold fast that um, holds on to rocks and they are at the bottom of the ocean is where you find them unless a storm pulls them away when they go floating. The sargassum we're going to talk about are just two species, sargassum natans and fluitans. One of them has two morphotypes that are often found, so two different ways of looking, but it's the same species. And they're very different from normal algae because they're never attached to the seafloor. They're always floating. They have those little bubbles called aerocysts that make it possible for the algae to float. And instead of having seeds, the algae actually just propagates by um, making two. So it's fragments. So from one algae, it becomes two algae and they keep growing. And that's how the algae, uh, the sargassum becomes more pieces of sargassum. And until now, nobody has seen um, seeds or anything that, that is um, actually like um, in terms of um, sexual reproduction um, happening with the algae. So it's very interesting algae and it can float all over the ocean. 
which uh, makes it a much bigger habitat it can encompass than the algae that are um, attached to the sea floor and need to be in places where um, the sea floor is not that deep to have still sunlight to make photosynthesis. So historically, the sargassum has been found in the Sargasso Sea, which is named after this algae. Even Christopher Columbus has sailed through the Sargasso Sea and found sargassum there. Um, as such, some of it would come to the Caribbean, as you can see with the yellow lines, but very small amounts that then go into the Gulf of Mexico, where it would grow a bit faster and more because of the nutrients and then go back into the Sargasso Sea. The Sargasso Sea is the only sea without a land border. It's bordered by currents that keep everything inside. It's one of the gyres we have in the ocean. And it is actually a protected area. So the Sargassum in the Sargasso Sea uh, is protected by the Hamilton Declaration. Um, because it is such an important habitat. And also in North America or in the US, not in North America, um, it's not you're not allowed to actually harvest sargassum to, um, to a certain extent. You're allowed to harvest a little bit, but not that much, just because back in the 1980s, people wanted to make products out of the sargassum and they wanted to protect this really important ecosystem. So in the Sargasso Sea, Sargassum is often referred to as the rainforest of the sea. Um, you have a lot of small animals in there that are very specialized to live in Sargassum. Um, generally, when you have something floating on the sea surface, whether it's Sargassum, a piece of wood, a piece of plastic, um, there will be animals aggregating around it. Um, so once you have those small animals, um, the crabs, the shrimp, the larvae fish in there, then that attracts bigger fish and that attracts even bigger fish um, such as tunas and even dolphins. Um, we had a really awesome interview with um, some dolphin researchers from the Bahamas who told us how dolphins are using sargassum for playing. So they're using... Um, sargassum like a ball they can toss between each other um other animals that are using the sargassum is the birds you know seabirds also like to eat fish so they get attracted to the sargassum mats and then the baby sea turtles so once the sea turtles um, come out of their nests and they go into the ocean they don't go to the reef or the near shore they go into the open ocean and when sargassum is available, they really like to hang out in the sargassum. It helps them to camouflage, um, we think. We, we're not 100% sure what it all helps them to do. It's um, it's also a bit warmer. They can sunbathe. They can restore their energy. Um, there's probably a lot of food around for them as well. So it's really a habitat they, that they like when they're out in the open sea and still very small. And because you have a lot of game fish, um, of, um, there's also fishermen who love to go fishing near the sargassum to get a good catch. So it's a really, really cool ecosystem. And here just a few of the species you can see. You can see how camouflaged that seahorse is and how the little baby sea turtles are really small and are hanging out in the sargassum. Then this is... I think one of the favorites of most people, the sargasso fish or sargassum frogfish. It's a small fish, maybe five centimeters long um, on average. And it's it's a predator, so it will eat um, other animals. Um, and it's, it's very camouflaged and it's very hard to see. Like I've picked up a piece of sargassum before thinking it was sargassum and it started moving in my hand and I had a fish in my hand. The other really cool thing that happens in the Sargasso Sea is that the freshwater eels, both from Europe and from North America, swim at the end of their life back to the Sargasso Sea. So they spend, they go for like 3,000 kilometers to the Sargasso Sea where they lay their eggs and then the larvae um, from the eels with the currents of um, um, the 
the Gulf Stream go back to the US and back to Europe. I tried to figure out how these two species stay different because one is the American eel and the other one is the European eel and I haven't found anything about that. But it's just, it's the only place they spawn and it just shows how important of an ecosystem sargassum can be and how adapted a lot of species are to it. So, but let's talk a bit about what happened to us and to the Caribbean. So in 2009 to 2010, there was a really extreme Northern Atlantic oscillation. And the currents in around the Sargasso Sea were um, not as strong as they normally are for quite a long time. And this was the strongest um, uh, um, extreme, a um, minimum extreme that has been recorded so far and likely due to climate change. So because of the climate change, our currents are changing and these types of things can happen. The wind was still strong. So the wind was able to move sargassum to the north of Africa. And this is all um, modeled afterwards. So we don't have any like pictures or evidence of this. But this is what um, the modelers and the, the people looking into how this happened think is the most likely way this happened. And then from the north of Africa, it went down into the tropical Atlantic. And here is where we now have the sargassum belt between Africa and the Gulf of Mexico. And that area has some natural upwelling that brings nutrients up in winter so especially in october november december when we actually don't get a lot of sargassum the sargassum is in that tropical atlantic and it gets fueled with the natural upwelling and generally by february they can say if it's going to be a bad sargassum year or not based on how much is already there as a, a starting ground and then um when the the currents change because of um, how you know the winds change from from winter to summer, and the currents also. Then the sargassum is is put into that current that pulls towards the Caribbean, and it goes past the outflow from the Amazon and the Orinoco. When it goes to Africa, it goes past the outflow from the Congo, where there's even more nutrients, uh, man-made nutrients, because there's a lot of agricultural runoff that comes out of these um, rivers. And then, of course, when it comes close to land everywhere, there's always runoff as well from agricultural practice, land use practice, sewage um, not being um, disposed of or cleaned properly. So all of that helps the sargassum grow, all those nutrients and, and the light down there as well. And uh, the water is a little bit warmer than the sargasso sea too. Even though I think this year we had some sargassum becoming smaller between May and June and June and July, which is the first. And it may be because of the very high temperatures we have in the ocean. I mean, that's still something that has to be figured out, but just knowing from the work that Evelyn's group has been doing on what kind of temperature sargassum likes to, to grow in, 26 degrees to is kind of like the the really nice point for most of the two species. So I think when we are hitting really high water temperatures, it may not grow as much as normally. So this um, will be explained to you in much better details by Rick in one of our videos. He's, he's one of the authors on this paper. He's one of the people who figured out how this works. And he's really awesome in explaining it in very easy words. Like I read the paper, I kind of understood it. And then he told me in in our podcast, and I was like, wow, I cannot say it as good as you can. He, he's really, really good at that. So this is now also what sargassum looks like, a huge problem. This is in Playa del Carmen, where I currently live. Um, the picture was taken before the COVID pandemic. So the people are not wearing these scarves because of COVID 
or anything else, but because of the, the smells. And you probably know these smells as well from the sargassum. When it's rotting, there's hydrogen sulfide, there's methane, there's all kinds of gases coming off that smell bad um, and also that give you um, health impacts. So from getting a headache, from feeling nauseous, from having your eyes water, from actually having difficulties to breathe and um, long-term problems with your lungs like asthma. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen because of the smells. And there are people, for example, in Martinique and um, other French islands, which their house is right next to a place that is inundated with sargassum like this. And the hydrogen sulfide levels in their house is above what is um, safe for people. So it is a really big problem, not only for the people who are cleaning up the beach, but also for anybody who who lives or works close to sargassum and, and is smelling it um, uh, for a long time every day or for several weeks or months. Um, some of the other negative effects that the sargassum can have is if it blocks it if it gets blocked in a bay and doesn't all get on the beach but stays in the water and gets really thick the sargassum will start decomposing because it's not in a healthy state it's too thick it's there's too much of it it cannot move and when it decomposes it takes up oxygen from the water and then there's the oxygen is depleted at one point and if fish or other animals are not realizing what's happening and are not getting out fast enough, sometimes we have um, events of fish being killed in the base or turtles having to get rescued out of base. Um, at the bottom picture, you can see um, and bottom right, um, seagrass beds in the Turks and Caicos Islands. This is from South Caicos. Um, that was what part of my first studies. We were looking at how the sargassum affects seagrass beds and a lot of that decomposing sargassum will be taken out in a strong tide and then it doesn't float anymore and it stays on the ground and it can actually kill the seagrass and anything else that's down there. I've seen about, I would put my hand through the the brown stuff on the on the bottom and sometimes my hand would get would hit the sand when my elbow was still in the brown stuff. So that's about, I don't know, almost 30 centimeters of um, deposit of sargassum in the water, underwater. So that also can happen and it can affect the seagrass beds. Also, when you get brown water, that can have a really bad effect on the seagrass beds and on all the animals living in the water. Um, the picture in the middle on top, um, that's a picture to show that it will affect tourism. Um, people don't want to pay lots and lots of money to go to a beach that smells and where you have brown water and you have to wade through um, seaweed. And it, it, you know, people will know about the sargassum or did know about the sargassum effect really fast and tourists want it to be dealt with really fast, even if it's a completely new thing. And of course the hotels are not at all um, ready to deal with it. So the hotel industry is throwing a lot of money at sargassum management when they can, because otherwise they're losing all their income because the beach is often a very important part of, um, of, their, um, of what they offer to, to their guests. Um, I told you um, fishermen in the Sargasso Sea like the sargassum to fish. It's the same for some people in the Caribbean, but it also impacts fishermen. So if you have a bay like this where the fisher boats are in the sargassum, they will have a hard time getting out because the sargassum gets caught in their props. Um, when they fish and there is a lot of sargassum, it gets caught in their nets. They have to clean them longer. Um, some places like Barbados, where they're um, catching flying fish, they actually change to amberjack because they, the flying fish can't really fly around in the sargassum. So they started actually catching a different type of fish and had also a decrease in fish 
catch and that that was like that is their island symbol the flying fish so it has a cultural impact as well and Guyana also had a huge decrease in fisheries because they use a lot of trawling nets and the sargassum would you know get stuck in it and would make it impossible to trawl for fish um some fishermen um go fishing by um spear fishing and if they don't wear um the gear like a rash guard or even um a neoprene they may get um um st- stung by the hydroids that are attached to the sargassum so it's not actually the sargassum that stings you but the little hydroids it's um in the family of the jellyfish and of the corals and they look like a little tree attached to the sargassum a little clear tree and they will sting you and lead to yeah um having um um yeah red bumps on your on your um arms or legs or anywhere you touch it and some people even have to go to the hospital for that one thing that not a lot of people know is the hydrogen sulfide also leads to higher corrosion in electronics so if you have a business or a house where you have a lot of hydrogen sulfide it doesn't only affect your health but it will also mean that your fridge, your TV, your air conditioning may have to be replaced faster um, because of the corrosive effects of the gas, which is already a problem in the Caribbean because of salt, and this is just made worse. Um, but there are also some positives. So we were um, scientists have been able to figure out how to see sargassum from space with satellites. So they use the satellites that take up different colors by themselves, different color spectrums. And they're able to make these maps that show where the sargassum is. And we also have a video made about this to explain how it works and what, when it doesn't work that well, because when you have clouds, you cannot see with the satellites. And they then use those maps and the currents and other things to make projections of um, sargassum landing both in the next few days, but also how much sargassum will come to the region in the next few months. So this really, really helps. Uh, Michel, you have your um, hand raised. Yes, I had a question there because um, tracking the sargassum is obviously going to be a very important aspect. Um, I've I found the resources where you can see this mapping and the, the forecasts. Uh, they're free. Uh, I think I don't I don't know if you could share the the links in the in the chat, but it's not. I don't think it's useful for local forecasting on a day to day to try and prevent anything. Um, do you have any tips or or does anyone in here have any ideas of how the different islands are coping on a day to day to try and forecast for themselves? Yes, I agree with you that it helps to know if things like if something big is coming your way, but knowing which beach gets um, impacted is still very difficult with these forecasting systems. They are working on making them better. I'm using even more detailed satellites, but everybody I've talked to who have used these systems or tried them out, they said, they're using them to see like what well, kind of like is there a lot coming or not, but then they use their local knowledge and um more the to to figure out where it's coming and it's still a bit uh, ad hoc of what's coming on. But for example, in Bonaire, they know if it is in Lagoon Bay that the next bay will be Lac Bay. So there they have just you know, done observation after observation and seen a pattern, which may not be um, something that can be done anywhere, everywhere, but in some places, maybe your currents always move a bit the same way and you can see patterns. And in other places, it may be more difficult and it's really um, difficult to know. But talking to people who are on the ocean a lot, fishermen, people who do snorkel tours, etc they will often know exactly where the sargassum is found and when it comes where. So they have a lot of knowledge just from being out there all day and probably can tell you better how to forecast it than, than the actual satellites, in my view. 
But do you think the satellites would help you on a uh, week by week, uh, month by month kind of uh, uh, scenario? Or the day by day, you really have to look for local knowledge of how, how it's uh, of the streams and the wind, uh, the how the winds are traditionally coming in and everything like that. But the satellite images would help you maybe more on a week by week level for it. So yes, yes. For example, here in Mexico, when they see a lot of sargassum coming from the Jamaica area towards Mexico, we know that we have to brace for um, a lot of sargassum in like one or two weeks time and we need to mobilize, but we don't know which, which beach gets hit the most. So I think the satellites definitely help with that. And also with like three months forecasting and forecasting of how the season's going to be. Uh, also yeah. here, uh, to say something about Mexico, they are using some, in some parts, drones. So they go to the ocean in, in a ship, in a little ship and go in a boat or in a little ship and put a drone to fly and they see how how much uh, length of the of the beach is the large med of sargassum so they can do some calculations to know the between the velocity and the wind the wind velocity and if the currents are active in that in that moment they will know more or less how many days it will reach to the beach. So yes. they are using drones and some people already know which days or which months are the months uh, of more sargassum beaching. So that doesn't, um, that happens always. Not in the same amounts, but you will always have sargassum in the same beaches when you have this type of monitoring and maybe having one peop one person monitoring one beach that you have that you know that there is sargassum you will see sargassum again so if you want to have also the the species or the kilograms you will have to have one person to to keep going to that beach and monitor yeah, to have so, a local knowledge. Yeah, you can you can do like a monitoring for a year to kind of see what the patterns are. Yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that the next year is going to be the same, no. but it can help a bit in knowing what's happening. Um, I know in Tobago, they're using the local airlines, or at least they did. And the airline that's flying anyways between the islands would give um, input on how bad the sargassum is and where it is at. And here in Mexico, I heard that the skydiving companies that fly to do skydiving with people also do that. So that's definitely, a, a, I think, a, a way that we could we could use more of that because we do have a lot of small planes traveling between Caribbean islands. And maybe if we could have those pilots um, after each flight fill out where sargassum is or give really easy accounts of it and somebody puts it all together that would be really useful i think but that's unfortunately not in in place yet has anybody been doing um any type of recording video recording maybe one frame every five minutes one frame every 10 minutes of uh of the base to see how many how much sarcasm is floating by or anything like that because sargasm doesn't move that quickly i mean you can take if you take a video with 60 frames a second, you have a lot of data. You can't afford that. But if you take one frame every five minutes, you can uh, easily progress, see the progress of, uh, of the sargasm floating by, for example. Yeah, I don't know if anybody who's done that. I know a lot of people who do the surveys of how much is on the beach regularly, either with drones or just with um, with measuring um, devices and quadrats and measuring how much is on there. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't heard about that, but that would definitely be a good way of doing it. I, I personally, when I want to go to a beach and I'm not sure if it has sargassum, I check the webcams of the hotels 
on that beach and, and check if it's worth traveling, for example, to the neighboring town, Porto Morelos, to go for a snorkel or if they have brown water and it's not worth going there. Yeah, I know I know somebody here in Mexico that's doing the thing that Michael proposed. His name is Jose Lopez Portillo. I don't know if he has a paper yet, but you can write his name and maybe search for a paper of him. His name is Jose Lopez Portillo. Do you want to put it in the chat? Yes, I will um, write it in the chat. And he has a cam he, watching the, the beach and he's tracking, like he has like three years of tracking sargasso. Other, other question, just for me to you know, how fast more or less does it travel? Do you have an indication? I understand it's with the ocean flows, but, but how fast, but, 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 uh, what are you talking about? Um, it's actually quite fast. I would say probably one to two miles an hour but it really depends on, on your local currents. But I've seen base fill up um, when doing um, field work in St. Vincent, we had this like we big open bay. And yeah, like if you're gone for half an hour, then afterwards the bay could be completely full while you, it was completely clear before. And yeah, it, it can move quite quickly, but it can also get stuck somewhere and move very slowly. It just really depends. It's it's a it's a combination of wind and current driven um, movement that it has. Okay. Well. And yeah, I can ask Marion when she's back from vacation because they making they make a, a modeling of the of the sargassum with the currents, and you actually can use um, their the modeling software for a whole month. And um, she will probably have a really good answer for how fast it travels because they, they model it all the time. Can you also share that in the chat? I would be very interested in something. Yes, so that will that's actually shared in your syllabus on how the modeling stuff. So we'll get to that later. And um, Marion, I, I will email her about this. And once she's back from vacation, she can answer the question and I'll let you guys know. So once the sargassum arrives on your beach or close to the beach, um, most um, places, if they have the money, are trying to get rid of the sargassum on the beach, which is a good thing to do because when you have it rotting on the beach, it impacts both humans who are on the beach, but also the animals in the water and also sea turtles who want to, especially the baby ones who want to get to the water. And um, the moms normally can go over the sargassum, but they may end up trying to nest in the sargassum or the sargassum goes on top of their nest and it increases the temperature of it. So removing it, it's definitely good for all the ecosystems and also the people who are trying to use the beach. How to remove it is, is um, something that there has been a lot of research done and a lot of innovation done. So the cheapest um, way to remove it is um, by pitchforks. It's also one of the best ways because it has very little impact on the beach, but of course it's very labor intensive. Um, and the, the people who are doing the work may get um, health impact from if the sargassum is already um, decomposing. So once it starts decomposing, that method becomes unsafe for the workers. Um, some other places um, have the beach rake, which you can see at the bottom, the green machine. Um, it's a tractor or like um, a tractor-like um, thing that... Um, pulls this rake that goes around. It's like a conveyor belt and it picks up the sargassum. Um, it's definitely more comfortable, but I just talked to Jake Keel from Punta Cana Resort last week and he said he really wants to see that there is some innovation made around this beach rake because this is not a made exactly for sargassum. It's made just to rake the beach of sea other things. 
and it actually compacts a lot of the sargassum into the beach. And he would love to see um, somebody come up with a better solution of, of having a beach rake that, that is made for sargassum. Another really good way of managing the sargassum is to put a boom out so the sargassum doesn't even reach the beach and then it accumulates there. And from the accumulation, you can use boats, uh, mostly with conveyor belts that are um, harvesting the sargassum. And that way the sargassum doesn't have any sand in it. There's no impact on um, the beach. So the beach is mostly sargassum free, which is really good for hotels, but also good for um, ecological important places. Um, booms, for example, have been used to make sure the sargassum doesn't get into mangroves in, in Bonaire. And, um, but this method is very costly and the booms don't work if you have big waves. And unfortunately, sometimes the sargassum is so bad that you have to use really big equipment to take it off. Um, this is oh, um, really not how sargassum should be managed. But once it gets really bad, sometimes it's the only way. Um, it takes a lot of sand off. It makes a lot of impact. Um, it probably costs a lot of money as well. And it, um, yeah, you have a lot of rotting sargassum afterwards. So this is not ideal and has a big impact. So unfortunately, what normally happens once the sargassum is collected, it's just put in a landfill somewhere. This is on South Caicos in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And mostly on that landfill, there is no like barrier between the sargassum and the soil which is problematic because the sargassum acts like a sponge out in the ocean and it takes up a lot of toxins. Toxins. It takes up heavy metals. Um, arsenic is one of them as well. And it takes up chlordecone in the French islands. So the French island waters are still um, contaminated with chlordecone, which was a fertilizer that they used back in the days in the banana fields before they realized it is toxic. And now they still have um, areas where you cannot fish and the sargassum is now taking up that chlordecone, which is good because it's cleaning the ocean, but it's bringing it back to our shores and telling us now we have to deal with all the stuff we are putting in the ocean. And if we are just dumping the sargassum somewhere without a membrane under it, then all those toxins, when it starts um, raining or the sargassum is um, wet and um, decomposing can go into the soil, can go into the groundwater and really um, contaminate as well. And there's also places like um, St. John, which don't actually have space for a sargassum landfill. So they, uh, there's a lot of sargassum arriving there and there's not much space on the island to have a landfill. So um, we really have to find a way to to make products out of the sargassum so that um, once we clean it up from the beach, it's not just dumped somewhere else and creating another problem somewhere else, but that we can actually use the resource and um, make something from it. And when you make products, it also means you can make money from the sargassum, which can offset some of the costs of picking it up. And here are just a few products you can make out of sargassum. Um, you can make paper and cardboard, and that's also apparently water resistant and um, fire resistant paper and cardboard, which is pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of companies who make fertilizers or biostimulants out of sargassum and who get them tested for arsenic or have the methods of getting arsenic out. Some also don't test, so you have to be very careful there is people who've done compost out of it. Again, be very careful um, because of the arsenic problem. Um, I would personally not use any sargassum compost on anything I want to eat. And if I put sargassum compost on in a, a in a in some soil, I wouldn't then if I'd done that like several years in a row, I wouldn't then change that to a patch where I grow food because it can accumulate in the soil as well. 
In the Dominican Republic, they use sargassum together with yuca to make single-use plates, which you can see on top, which is really cool. And here in Mexico, um, a guy, um, Omar, has has made brick, makes bricks and houses out of it. And I think he's just been in the news again. He's he's very world famous or Caribbean famous about this, even though a lot of people here in Mexico don't know about him, which is quite interesting. And there's a company which makes shoes out of it, and you will get one pair of their shoes, a different one than the one here. And there's also companies who make soaps and facial creams, etc., out of the sargassum. Again, they make sure those are tested for arsenic because you don't want to put anything on your skin that has heavy metals in it. And um, FIO and Surmise in um, Barbados made this really, really cool graphic that goes with a really big report that we will look at in our week three when each of you will actually research one sargassum product and this just kind of shows an overview of what all can be done with sargassum and how much of what you can make out of it. So, for example, there's not that many alginates in sargassum, so it's just one component of the sargassum. So one ton of fresh sargassum only gives you 22 kilos of alginates, but that same ton could make like... 44,444 soap bars. So those will definitely weigh way more than 22 kilos. So it's a lot of companies are actually looking at um, making multiple products and um, seeing how they can combine products. Uh, Michelle, is this an old hand or I, do you have a new hand raised? That's a new one. Um... Okay. For example, you mentioned earlier that uh, the gases that are being released when it's when it's decomposing, you said there's also methane. That's what I also read in one of the papers. Mm -hmm. um, why isn't anybody, especially if you have, if you can't produce it, uh, if there's a lot of heavy metals or anything in it, uh, make a lining, uh, deposit it uh, in large quantities, and capture the escaping methane gases and use it uh, for for cooking purposes or something like that. Yes, there are people who are looking into making biogas and methane out of sargassum. What they found is that there is some inhibitors that actually it produces less methane than you would think. So they are looking into figuring out which these inhibitors are because if they find them, they could potentially extract them, which then could maybe be used for cows to make them not produce as much methane. And at the same time, they could make more biogas. And for example, in Barbados, they have found a way to use the wastewater from rum distilleries together with the sargassum. And that get, get, gets a better yield in the methane than when you're just using regular water or, or what you would normally use with land plants. So there's a lot of research being done on how to make good biofuel and uh, biogas out of sargassum. But it's, as most products from sargassum, it's just not as easy as you think in theory. And um, it's all about figuring out the best way to do it so it starts to become economically feasible. Um, so to make sargassum products at the moment, I don't know of any product that uses decomposed sargassum. Uh, most products use very fresh sargassum. So that means you only have a few hours after you pick it on, up on the beach or you pick it up by boat to make products. And picking it up by boat is definitely the preferred way of picking it up if you want to make products. And the boat at the bottom um, left is a very expensive boat that's like several hundred thousand dollars. But um, SOS Carbon in the Dominican Republic has found a way to just make two loops to go on a fishing boat and then add nets to it. And that is also a way to pick up sargassum and give jobs to fishermen. Um, they say that there isn't much bycatch in their method, which is always important to know when you pick it up from the water. Um, but yeah, if you want to make products 
until now, most products need very fresh sargassum. And of course, you don't want to have sand in it and then you don't have to clean it as much. So that makes it also harder because once the sargassum starts decomposing, there's really not much we can do with it. But there is research on the way to see if anything can be made out of the, de the half decomposed or decomposed sargassum. So the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is carbon sequestration. As you know, we have a climate change problem and due to um, industrial revolution we've had and fossil fuels, we've added a lot of extra carbon to the atmosphere that was locked in the ground before. And that's about 1,500 gigatons. And um, our CO2 levels used to be at 280 parts per million. And now we are at 420 parts per million. More than ever before, humans have um, had in, in their atmosphere. So it's really concerning. And safe levels are about 350. So we really not only have to stop our emissions as fast as possible, but we also have to take some of the pollution we've already done in the atmosphere out of it. And the IPCC report, which says what we should be doing on climate from a scientific view, they say there's no way to stay under 1.5 degrees of warning or even two degrees, which is our safe space. Um, without removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So we cannot just stop polluting. We also have to clean up and we have to clean up quite a bit. And the problem is that we haven't really found good ways to do cleanups. We still have to in 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 get a good broom and a good um, mop that can mop up our atmosphere. And that's that's one of the biggest challenges we have with climate change. Um, you probably have heard that trees can be planted to store carbon and to sequester carbon. That all happens through photosynthesis. So the trees take up CO2 and they turn it into sugars and energy and leaves and biomass. And then they release O2 that we then can breathe. And also the trees um, and other plants, of course, they breathe as well especially at night when there's no light because photosynthesis does need light to happen. And it's not only trees on land, it's also what we call blue carbon. So the mangroves, the sea grasses, the salt marshes that um, put CO2 in the soil below them. And it's also the algae. So algae is often forgotten in the blue carbon, but um, the algae, even though they are on rocks or they're floating freely, once they die and they get taken off the rocks or they sink, the the carbon that they have in their biomass will get sequestered in the deep sea or in the not so deep sea. But sargassum, because it does float often above the deep sea, is actually a really, really important carbon sink. And in the sargasso sea, you have four times as much sargassum found on the deep sea floor than on the surface of the water. So that just shows that this is quite a natural um, process that happens. And we could increase that by um, artificially sinking sargassum. And sargassum is really awesome compared to other algae, for example, kelp, because it is already growing in the open ocean. So there's a lot of space where it can grow naturally. Um, it is buoyant, so you don't need any lines, any things to keep it there. It is a habitat for a lot of animals, so it does increase biodiversity. But those animals don't really eat the sargassum, so you don't have the animals eating your crop. It can double in 7 to 23 days. So that's one of the problems we have right now, why the sargassum influx is so bad, because... The sargassum mat you see in about two weeks, it will be double the size. And then that bigger mat will be double the size again in two more weeks. And that's why it becomes so big because it uses fragmentation for doubling and not just um, uh, doesn't have to do seeds and stuff, which is great if you want to actually grow sargassum because um, 
then you don't need to have seedlings or anything. And of course, there's already a lot of sargassum there. So you don't actually need to grow sargassum at all to start using it for carbon sequestration. But if you want to do it at a really large scale, you may even have to grow more than is actually hitting the Caribbean right now. And luckily, there's a large tolerant range that sargassum has to salinity and also to temperature. So it can be grown in a lot of places. There's a lot of things you can make with it. So valorization pathways are there, still being looked at, but it is a useful algae. And you don't need a lot of nitrogen compared to the carbon that or the CO2 you can take up. So C2N ratio in plants says how much nutrients you have to give or fertilizer you have to give a plant in order for it to um, make biomass or grow. And 13 point, 34.5, uh, 43.5, sorry, um, is quite good and uh, much much higher than for example phytoplankton um that is just flowing in the in the ocean so i want to bring up the perspectives again and i hope that um the presentation i gave to you widened your perspectives a bit on what sargassum can be and also um listen into our podcast um, if you want to hear more and learn more from the experts. And yeah, let's have some questions if you have any more from what we've already talked about. Well, <clears throat> I think it's Martin, so I have a question. If you say you want to use it more for carbon capturing uh, over the oceans, don't you think it would also be dangerous if you start to uh, spread it even more to other oceans where it's not uh, at the moment? And if you see the ex enormous explosion that we now see of the growth uh, and, and what it does to the environment uh, when it reaches the shores, uh, do you think there's an even bigger risk than the, the amount of capturing? Um, yeah, there's definitely a risk there. And I wouldn't advocate for taking it out of the Atlantic and bringing it into the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, even though it has been seen there, but in small amounts. Um, the company I currently work for is looking at using sargassum for carbon sequestration. Um, as a first step, we would use the sargassum that's already there and sink it um, you know, in the Caribbean, in deep waters. But then as a second step, when you know, we really want to make this bigger and we learned more about sargassum and how it works. And we figured out um, really like we did really good environmental impact assessments of the deep sea because we don't want to harm the deep sea either by trying to solve a problem. We would try to do sargassum farms in the South Atlantic gyre. So that's similar to the Sargasso Sea, a closed system with currents around it. And it's where it doesn't have many storms there. So we would hope that something like what happened in the Sargasso Sea that led to the escape of um, the sargassum there would not happen. And if it did, then it would be our responsibility to go and chase the sargassum and clean it up and not have it go to the beaches like it is um, the responsibility of oil companies to clean up an oil spill if th that happens, which of course is not always taken, but I hope that the company I work for would actually take that responsibility if something like that would happen. Okay, that's clear. And I, I have a second question. You say uh, to make it uh, to the valorization of it is you need to use the uh, harvested uh, sargassum within one and a half hour, more or less, or two hours. Twelve, twelve, maybe. Uh, twelve. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so to keep it fresh. Yeah. Well, that is already also a challenge, but twelve is more than one and a half. To, okay. Sorry. Yeah, and it's. I mean, twelve is what um, a company here in Mexico told me. And it's from 12 hours from the sargassum reaching the beach. So as soon as it's on the beach, it starts drying, it starts decomposing. So you then have less than 12 hours from when you pick it up. 
which is challenging because of course it may already been on the beach for a few hours. Okay, thank you. But it does depend on each product, how, how long you can use it. And in general, they have, um, they say you should clean the sargassum in the first 48 hours in order not to get the health impacts and the, the, the hydrogen sulfide um, really hitting um, your community. Yeah, we had a thumbs up. Sorry. That's okay. I was going to ask, do you know of any use for it once it started decomposing? Uh, I don't know of any. Evelyn, do you know of any decomposed sargassum use? Well, I don't know also, but some people has also used it as fertilizer, but it's not recommended because you okay. you will have a lot of high high acid ah, I sorry yeah. for my uh, acid sulfuric so yeah hydrogen sulfide yeah hydrogen sulfide yes it's not recommended okay oh, so sulfuric acid I guess yeah sulfuric acid Fran yeah. Jeffrey had his hand up yeah yeah I have a question go ahead like the um, as you said, just a question, like, I live in Angola and the, the sargassum hits us, but we're not seeing it as frequently as other countries. But as you said, the sargassum is getting bigger. It's going to be hitting the Caribbean islands harder every fast. Because why notice it, it hits, like, in Angola? Um, it's very unpredictable, but sometimes, I don't know, three to four months. But when it comes, it comes in bulk. But I would just like to know if you think it's if it's gonna be coming more frequently and more and more loud. I think a okay. lot of places have seen their sargassum season become longer. Like it used to be just two or three months at the beginning, and now Mexico, the DR, it's almost like nine months of the year or eight months of the year. It starts already kind of in March and it goes till October, so. Last year think, was all year. I think um, Anguilla gets sheltered a lot by just the angle of which it's coming in. It gets sheltered a lot by St. Martin coasts. So most of it is blocked and then the rest kind of flows around Anguilla with the, the common uh, wind flow, the uh, direction of the wind that's happening and the currents. But yeah. when the winds change, then they come in at angles on St. Martin beaches for example, the south uh, west um, uh, into Malabi, for example, things like that. And those are typically the days that Anguilla has heavy um, sargasm as well because the winds change just for a day or two and then the sargasm comes over to Anguilla. And it seems counterintuitive, but if you don't have sargassum that often, it makes managing it almost harder because then there's less incentives to buy the equipment or less, less, you don't, yeah, you don't have, you may don't have the money to buy the equipment or your, your hotel or your municipality doesn't want to, doesn't want to invest just for a few days. So it can almost, sometimes it can make it harder to manage the sargassum if you don't have it that often to get the resources for it because they would stand still for a long time. Sammy, it also, a... oh, sorry, yeah. Evelyn. I was just going to say it also makes the response from the community much stronger if they're not used to it. We have communities on the windward side that deal with this year round. Um, and then when it turns, just um, as we were discussing now and hits Simpson Bay all of a sudden, the reaction is uh, much stronger and more dramatic. Yes, I can, I can imagine because once you once you have it all the time, you're kind of used to it and you you live with it. But when, if you don't have it, then then you don't, don't you expect to have a clean beach. Samuel, you have ha had your hands up for a while. Yes, question. Um, are there any regional or international conventions, um, government agencies, or anything of that sort? at the government level that actually 
deals with um sargasm, seeing that sargasm is becoming such of a big problem in the region and probably in other parts of the world. Are there any meetings or any groups that's assigned to this particular problem in the region or outside? Yes, um, the UN does um, submitting. I think it's part of the UN UNEP, if I'm correct. Um, there's also a lot of times when there are conferences about sargassum in 2019 was the International Sargassum Symposium. And there were scientists there, there was government officials there, and there were was an expo for people who are had products made out of sargassum or um, ways to, to clean up sargassum. So a lot of the events or the conferences, there was just one in the DR where it was also a mix of these three stakeholders together. So the, the different Caribbean or wider Caribbean governments definitely talk to each other regionally about how to manage sargassum. And um, I know from the DR is now a big push to get the, um, let me see what it's called. I think it's the Inter-American Bank. Um, like it's kind of like the World Bank, but for the region to start a fund about sargassum specifically to to be able to like where projects that want to manage sargassum or who want to do research and development in new methods can apply apply for grants so they are they are just working on that um Jake Keel from um Punta Cana asked me last week if I um would work as a consultant um for them to figure out who is who in the sargassum world so hopefully I don't know how long that process takes, if it takes a year, if it takes five years, we will have also more funding going on and not just talking of different um, government officials coming all together and each of them giving a little speech of how bad it is in their island and that something needs to be done. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Well, there are many, many more questions. But <laughs> 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 well, what one is? Is there any? Is, is there at this moment any options seen that you can also already start to harvest that op in the open oceans to prevent of growing it as fast as we're doing, as we're seeing it now, so to, to, to really tackle it at the beginning, or or is that completely, uh, yeah, futuristic? I think, I think that's, that's very difficult because, um, I mean, you probably all read the news about the blob coming to Florida earlier this year, but it's unfortunately not a blob, but it's very scattered. Like the way it comes to your beaches is the way it is out in the ocean. They're, isn't one big mass and it's still a huge area. It's a lot of sargassum, but the area it's in is huge. And being able to pick all of that up and making sure the sargassum belt is gone is, is would cost a lot, a lot of money. I don't even know how much, and it would like, you would need so many boats and so much fuel um, just to like, you know, go to everywhere in like between Africa and the Caribbean and pick up sargassum everywhere. I don't think it's possible. The the only like there has been people looking at picking up closer to shore, not with booms. And most of them say it's economically not not really sound or feasible. So that's why when you have a boom, it really starts accumulating and then it becomes you don't have to drive very far with your boat and there is the sargassum accumulated so you're like spending very a lot of time harvesting and very little time just driving and that seems to be the one way that it is the cheapest way to do it you you explained that it takes about uh yeah 12 hours useful hours to to make it into a product and that's from when it starts hitting the beach. So once it hits the beach, it starts to decompose. Huh? And that's yeah. within that 12-hour window. 
but if it were to build up behind the boom uh, and it collects, let's say, three days, four days, five days, a week, uh, would the sargasm, because it's in the water and it's still floating, would it stay fresh in that way? Or would it also start sinking? Because once I, I read once it starts sinking, building up and starts sinking, it also starts to decompose, but then in the water itself. Yeah, so behind the boom, because there's current, there's waves pushing it towards the boom, it really gets compacted a lot. And the sargassum needs to move in order to not sink, uh, not to, to stay alive. So it also starts dying when it starts accumulating by the boom. Um, uh, for my work, we've been trying out a way that we um, have a boom that's round, so like a, a paddock to put the sargassum in and that paddock like moves back and forth on the on the line because sargassum needs a lot of movement and we were able to keep it alive and growing for one month so we hope that we have to now like raise money to to make this like in a in a like valorization or a pilot farm that keep that that we can keep going for a year uh, but it is very promising as a storage, a way to store the sargassum because the ups and downs are very difficult for making products that one day you have too much sargassum to process with your machines and with your employees. And then another day you have almost none and you, you have no work for them to do. And if you could put the sargassum from the days when you have too much some of it you process, some of it you put into the storage farm. And then on the days when you don't have any, you take it from the storage farm, you can actually have production that is more more flattened than the up and down. Maybe not perfectly flat, but a bit more flattened. And maybe you can even keep it alive throughout the season when there's no sargassum, so you can produce all year round. Um, which can help with making products as well. Jessica, yeah, as it's accumulating again, it's also reproducing. Yeah, I I don't know. It, I mean, if you kept it alive for a month and it, it 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 continues to grow and expand every seven days, then it would be multiplying. No? Yes, yes, it, it is multiplying. So you would have to harvest from time to time. Um, but it's kind of like putting something in a bank account. If you have a business and you're actually interested in having sargassum to make products, you are saving the sargassum for the next day and you're getting interest on it. Exactly. And it, ideally, you would only be taking that interest exactly. and maintaining your bank. Yes. And then you're just following it. But it's trying to figure out what amount <laughs> to keep as your base that obviously it is ideal, that sweet spot. Yes, we still have to figure that out. <laughs> uh, Julie, you got a question. Um, what about methods to ensile it and extend the um, freshness period? Yes, we um, interviewed um, somebody from Orkney, which is a company in Norway that um, actually made hay bales, like the ones you see with like the, the plastic wrapped around from Sargassum. Um, when we interviewed her, it was like less than three months after they made the bales. So I actually I had it in my mind the last few weeks that I should ask her how, how, the, how the bales are doing, like if it is, because one of the things she wanted to test after like three months and six months is to see how fresh is it? Like how much the ensilement, um, you know, the the really the the pressure and keeping the it wrapped in plastic, and there shouldn't be much oxygen there. Does it keep it from decomposing? And how fresh does it keep it? But they also they had sargassum that came over from the Dominican Republic to Norway in a in a container in a um. Um, cooled container so it wasn't like the freshest sargassum you can think of either that they got so I see we have like 10 minutes left until we hit two hours of class and I don't want to keep you guys too long so 
um, we can maybe talk about the homework and then anybody who has more questions can stay after and ask more questions. But a lot of your questions will be also, I think, um, talked about in, in the videos we give you. It's a four week course. So we got lots of time to ask more questions and, and talk about sargassum. So for that, I just want to share my screen again. And get out of this if I can. Uh, so this is, I sent you this via email about a week, be, uh, about an hour before the course. So if you haven't checked your email, you may have not seen it. But this is what we call the syllabus. So that shows you everything that's happening in the course. So we are right here. We're having our Zoom session. And then until next week, Tuesday, we have several videos for you to watch. So we did this so that you can that it can um you can watch them when you have time. So we know we're all busy and we didn't want to have classes several times a week. It also makes it easier to get the real, like the, the experts and make um, videos that um, you can also share later on with people and other people can watch. So there's a lot of um, positives about it, but of course it also means you cannot ask people questions after they, like you're just watching a video. But if you have questions, you can ask them in the WhatsApp chat. You could send me and Evelyn emails or you can ask next week. So Evelyn and I will try to answer all the questions you have about these um, uh, videos. Jessica, you got your hand up? Yes, I was wondering, can I share these videos with my social media platforms so that yes. other people who are interested in going along this journey um, and learning alongside have the opportunity to do so? Yes, you can. And I will in the WhatsApp group and also send you guys an email just with um, the hashtags and the ads to to put when you put something on social media, um, just because we, you know, the, the course is is um, financed through the Resume project, which is from the European Union, and they like to be mentioned um, whenever possible. And, and they, they sometimes we share as well, what you're sharing and they will be are excited. These, are these independent sources though? Or are these affiliated with that particular program offering? Yeah. So, um, like we asked them, they have a grant project called the resin bit that is right. for the overseas Caribbean territories. And this course is part of a bigger project we're doing on novel education tools for sustainable ecosystem management. So yeah. they just- No, I was wondering the specific videos that you're gonna be providing and sharing, is that yeah. through that? Those from independent uh, sources? A bit of both. So the first one here um, is already a really good video that already existed on how to identify the different species of sargassum. So we weren't going to spend money and energy and resources to make another video. But right. a lot of the other videos, whenever you see producer, is the Sargassum Champions course. This yes. video has been made specifically for this course. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. For this week, you're going to have a lot of practical videos. So the first video is to identify the different species of Sargassum. And you may think, I'm not a biologist, why should I know this? Um, it's kind of fun to do, but also when you are thinking of making products, some um, species and morphotypes, they have different um, chemical um, setups and they will give like the different mix in the species will give you different um, outcomes in your product. So that's why it's kind of important to know. And then the second video is um, an app that you can use on your phone and that we ask you to try out. It's called EpiCollect. And it's a way to get, um, when you go to the beach, take data 
on how much sargassum is on the beach. And the, the data is um, uh, available so anybody can use it. So you can make your own data set and then analyze it. Or you, um, you, know, you can just collect the data and then somebody else maybe picks it up and analyzes it if there's enough data from your beach. Um, then we have explainer video on how the whole satellite um, detection of sargassum happens. And then followed, we have a tutorial on how to use SAM tool. So um, CLS has been very generous and they offered all, each of you one month free use of SAM tool, which is a detection software that uses the satellites and then the currents to, to show where the sargassum likely is gonna hit. And this little tutorial will show you how to use it. And there's also um, a whole user's guide where it's written down for the people who like it written down. Some people like to watch a video. Um, so that way you can get started. For that, you do have the how here how to log in and how to, um, um, yeah, like this is the website, this is the username and the password. Please do not share this with anybody outside of the course because um, this is really just for the people on the course. And then the last video is again, an explainer video on the best ways to remove sargassum seaweed from the beaches. Um, this is also based on a report by Sir Me, so you can also look into the report. Each of the videos has um, in the description more resources. So if you're really interested in it, look at them. It's not needed for the course, but just for the people who are interested in something, you can always re um, learn more. Michelle? Yeah, I just had a question about the, the syllabus that you're showing on the screen right now. Yes. Uh, was that... Uh, maybe I missed it, but was that emailed to us? Are we going to receive that still? I see you're using it in Google Docs. Yes, I emailed you a PDF of it. Okay. And I emailed it like 45 minutes before we started class. Uh, that's why I didn't see it. All right, thank yeah. you. And if anybody di didn't get it, just email me or send a WhatsApp and we'll make sure you get it. Um, the other thing we want you to look at is this really cool book called Suddenly Sargassum, which is um, from Le Fruit de Mer, which is in um, St. Martin, the French site. You will, when you get the package with the shoes and the book and other things that we're not telling you yet what it is, um, you will get an actual printed copy of this book. And it's a beautiful book. It has really cool pictures of um, the animals that live in the sargassum both out in the ocean um, on the beach and also the birds that use it so have especially look at those pictures and the animals you don't have to read the whole book so that when you go to the beach you can maybe take some pictures of the the animals you see and then check in the book if you can identify them um, it's a really really cool book and with really nice pictures. So then you have the one month trial that we talked about already. And here's the guide on how to use it. And then here are the links to download EpiCollect on your phone. And here's another website called Sargassum Monitoring where um, you can see pictures from every day. Like they look, they try to find all the pictures that are shared each day on sargassum and they put it on this website to show which beaches do have sargassum. So if you want, you can take pictures when you go to the beach and also send it to them. And here's another prediction website that kind of shows each week how much sargassum is there. Whenever I go there, it shows the sargassum from last week. So I don't know how useful it is personally, um, but it is still interesting to see um, where sargassum comes. So next to watching those videos and looking at these things, we actually have active homework for you guys. So 
use the SAM tool and also um, the, the um, inundation risk site and the monitoring site to find out if you don't know already which beaches, marinas, coastlines of your island are impacted by sargassum. And especially with the SAM tool, you can like try to see when do you, when does the SAM tool predict that sargassum will land on that beach or on your island. And if you have time to go out that day, um, you can go check if they were right. Like, and you can even in SAM tool, you can see how they, they tell you how big those mats are that are out in the ocean. So you can also see where they write about the size or where they're completely off. Then make sure you have the EpiCollect app on your smartphone before you go to the beach. And then when you go to the beach, um, look for the following things. Like look at, is the, fre is the sargassum fresh or decomposed? Is it smelly? Oh how much sargassum is on the beach? Are there, is there anything living inside the sargassum? So often when it starts decomposing, there are like little insects living in it. Um, there's also a lot of birds using it. If you want to go for a swim, I often like to go and, and check out sargassum when I'm swimming and I see a, a clump. There's sometimes really cool crabs in there. I found several sargassum um, frogfish in there already and other fish. So if you see want to see any animals living in it in the water, that's a good way to do it. Um, but also look at if sargassum is removed from the beach. Are there people removing it right now? Are there like tractor tracks or 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 tracks from people raking that show that it has been removed? Um, if sargassum is on the beach, which morphotypes, which different species of it do you find? Are you able to identify it after watching that video? Um, and yeah, just see if all the things you learned um, in those videos, if you can use them there. And take a lot of pictures because for next week, we want you to make a slide uh, with pictures or text, whatever you want to put on it. And then next week, you guys are going to present to each other um, what, how it is on your beaches. So prepare to talk for about two to three minutes, just so that the class doesn't go for three hours. And here is the link. So we have a, a, a Google presentation, which I think I have right here, just to show you. So we have only one slide right now, and then when you're ready, just add a slide. Um, it doesn't have to be in a particular order. And just make the slide however you want. It's it's your slide. You can you can um, do whatever you want with it. Just anything that helps you show what's happening on your island. And then next week, we just go through the presentation. And whoever slide comes up, they're the next to talk. So if you like to talk first. Make sure your slide is in the front. If you like to talk last, make sure it's in the in the back. Um, we just go through like that because if everybody had to open up a presentation, we would spend about an hour wasted just opening up presentations. And if you have any problems putting your stuff on the slide, let me know uh, or Evelyn and we will help you. And then the last thing for the homework is we have a little quiz each day, which is what I learned. Um, it's just for you to check after you've watched the videos. Um, if you understood it, um, you don't have to do the quiz, but it would be good for you to do just to check. And next week, Evelyn will tell you the answers to the quiz as well. So you can um, check if you got it right or not. Um, when we when we do the reveal of the answers but just like it's a bit of a knowledge review for yourself to see um if you understood what's happening in the in the videos are there any questions about this week jessica if there isn't a lot of sagasm on the beach this like this week 
what content would you like us to use for our presentation? Um, yeah, you can use content from this week, but if there isn't much and you have content from other days or you can also use that. You don't have to use um, pictures or content from this week. Right. And but also, if, yeah. We haven't started collecting any content per se. Exactly. Then what would you want us to use? Or what would you ex would like? What would you like from us? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really what you want to share about your island. So you, it's okay if there's not much on it, and you can also just report on what was there this week. But and but if you, as you said, if you know that normally there's more, or you you have a lot of more knowledge than what you just get from one one visit to the beach then feel free to share that. Like you don't have to be limited to that one beach visit and what you see there. If you have other knowledge, feel free to share or other pictures or other observations or really interesting observations from a year ago or from two months ago, share them okay. with us or questions about the observe, like you observed something really crazy and you want to, want to pick my brain and Evelyn's brain and everybody else's brain. Yeah, I use that and share it. Um, but don't feel bad if, you know, you don't have any previous observations. You go to the beach, there's no sargassum. You can totally report on that and that's completely fine. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I was just wondering if you were going to also send the presentation so we can also get the link for the podcast and stuff like that. Yes. Yes. I will send the presentation um, probably tomorrow just because I want to like update all the little notes at the bottom for you guys to have. And um, right after this class, I can send you the link for the podcast in the WhatsApp group. And um, yeah. And this video recording as well? Yes. I think tomorrow I can send, because the presentation and the video will be a bit bigger. So I will send them via vTransfer. So I'll make a vTransfer link and send the link via email and via WhatsApp. So you can download either, I think you won't download it on your phone, but um, probably via email. Does that work for everybody? Yeah, for sure. And I wanted to ask, does anybody object to us also recording the next sessions when you are presenting? Does anybody see a problem with that? No. Because, we, yeah, we were hoping to like give you the recordings, but also then afterwards put them on YouTube so the people who are following the course afterwards or just following it online without um, um, following directly, they can also access the, the, the really, hopefully really interesting content that we are producing together. No problem, I think. <laughs> I think no problem from what I see too. Cool. Good. All right. Um, so I think the last thing we have is to take a group picture. If people are up for opening up their cameras. All right. Uh, wait, wait, wait. All right, we're waiting. We're waiting. No worries. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah, it's also okay if it's not possible. I know we're not always in places where we want to open the camera and we may be on the, on the run. All right, anybody who wants to open the camera ready? All right, two, th 
Three, two, one, smile. And let's take another one. Three, two, one, smile. This course is made possible through funding by the Resilience, Sustainable Energy and Marine Biodiversity Program, ResinBit, financed under the 11th European Development Fund, EDF, Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories Regional Program. ResinBit is being implemented by Expertise France, with the primary stakeholders being the 12 Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories. The course was designed by Francisca Elmer and Evelyn Salas and the videos were produced by Marcel van der Kamp.